27. That is the consecutive number of weeks for this podcast that it turns out I have used the word game at some point in the podcast. One or more times. Rule Breaker Investing spends a third of its time on investing, a third of its time on business, and a third of its time on life, investing, business, and life. And yet, My transcriber shows that for 27 consecutive weeks, I have somehow managed, unwittingly, no less, to stick in the word game at least once, dating back to July 27th of last year. July 27th, when somehow I did not use the word game in a podcast titled, somewhat ironically, July Mailbag, The Thrill of Victory and the Agony of Defeat. Speaking of thrills, I am thrilled to connect this week with gamer, philosopher, and author, C. T. Nguyen. Most of all, T. is going to help you and me get, I think, above the game for a while this week. See the game outside the games that we play of investing business and life. Help you and me think through for a bit what games are, why we play games, why games are so valuable and sometimes destructive, and at a metagame level, whether we're in some games that we don't even realize we're playing as individuals and as a society. So from Catan to Twitter, let's range wide. And let's use the word game for at least a 28th consecutive week only on this week's Rule Breaker Investing. It's the Rule Breaker Investing Podcast with Motley Fool co-founder David Gardner. Well, I'm more than usually excited for our podcast this week. In fact, I'm going to call this one out right now like Babe Ruth mythically pointing to the fence before the next pitch comes in. If I do my job right this week, I think this will be a home run and maybe the year's first bestie. My guest this week, C. T. Nguyen, is in his own words, I'm C.T. Nguyen. This is from his website. I used to be a food writer. Now I'm a philosophy professor at the University of Utah. I write about trust, art, games, and communities. I'm interested in the ways that our social structures and technologies shape how we think and what we value. My first book is Games, Agency as Art. It was awarded the American Philosophical Association's 2021 Book Prize, It's about how games are the art form that work in the medium of agency. A game designer doesn't just create a world, they create who we are in that world. And I'll call it right there. That is his personal intro taken from T's website, objectionable.net. Before I welcome my fascinating guest and likely new best friend, a disclaimer, I have not yet read his book. Games Agency is Art. I certainly expect to do so. I have it on my Kindle, but my foolish listeners should know ahead of time that our talk is not informed by a real working knowledge of his work. Our talk is happening now simply because I'm so passionate and excited about this topic, and I know you're going to enjoy learning from him as much as I will. With all that said, C.T. Nguyen, welcome to Rule Breaker Investing. Hello, everyone. So first question, right off the top, your website, objectionable.net. How much did you need to pay for that URL? Who were you bidding against? No one had it. That's the weird (laughs) thing. Everything else I wanted was like $20,000, and then no one was sitting on that thing. So I was like, it's me. That's what I get. Now, your lazy interviewer will also disclaim, I haven't actually checked what's at objectionable.com. I'm not sure I should. Should I check that? Uh, I think it's someone squatting on it, asking for $10,000. Okay, got it. Well, T, it's a delight to have you. And I thought we should start maybe by sharing a few definitions of game. In fact, I've got a couple to share with you. And I'd love just to get your take on how right or wrong the definition is. And then, of course, I think you might provide your own. But let's just, you ready to play this game? Yeah. Great. So this one's from the OED, I believe. Game, a form of play or sport, especially a competitive one, played according to rules and decided by skill, strength, or luck. What do you think of that definition? Uh, Gross. (laughs) First of all, it it makes reference to terms. I mean, so a philosopher is trying to take something and give a definition of it in terms of things that are more explicable. Uh, If you define a game in terms of sport, then you have to find sport. And most of the good definitions of sport like return you to games. So you're just playing a little lovely circle. Uh, 
All right, that's the OED. Let's move, I don't know if this is going to get any better, to Merriam-Webster. T, here it is. A physical or mental competition conducted according to rules with the participants in direct opposition to each other. Um, problem with the, that definition is it's too big. Uh, two countries vying it out in the UN court also counts as a game under that definition because <laughs> it's a rule set and people interacting. This is the, in philosophy, whenever I do this with intro classes, there's the too big, too little problem. And that definition just like, it's really, I don't think that definite, I think that definition, if I heard it right, would like also capture uh, courtroom trials. Yeah. Probably not games. Maybe, yeah. maybe gamified by some, but certainly, certainly not games. You know, it also occurs to me as I read, read through that one again, there are so many wonderful co-op games today. Mm -hmm. And so this concept that you're in direct opposition to the person playing the game with you is definitely limited. Let me give you one more before opening it up and giving you the floor. Uh, You're probably going to recognize this one. A lot of people won't know the name Bernard Suits, uh, and I have not read his work. We'll talk about that maybe in a bit. But here is Bernard Suits' definition of a game. And I quote, this is from his book, The Grasshopper, the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. To play a game is to attempt to achieve a specific state of affairs using only means permitted by rules. That's the correct definition. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, um, that's, that's what I use in the book. We can talk a little bit. I want to I talk so much about that definition. That's such a good definition. Uh, I also think there are a few exceptions to it. So it's not a perfect capturing of natural language, but as like getting to the root of what's going on, what makes this special, the suit to definition is it. So this is book, um, Bernard Suits, The Grasshopper, uh, Games, Life, and Utopia. And it was it, pu- it was published in the 70s, I think, a little before its time. And it's just, it's so funny. It's so rich. It's so deep. It gives you this definition. And then it ends in one of the weirdest places. He has this, uh, this argument at the end that games are the purpose of life. And his argument at the end is this. Imagine utopia where we've solved all our practical problems. We've solved the medical problems. We've solved the therapeutic problems. Everyone has enough medicine, right? What would you do with your time? And he says, well, you would play games or you would be bored out of your skull. So games must be the purpose of life, (laughs) which seems weird unless you actually look at his account of game. So what Suits is saying is in a game – you are taking on unnecessary obstacles to create this activity of struggle. So in some sense, the struggle is the point or crucial to the point. So what he's saying is in every game, there's some state you're trying to achieve, but there's always some easier way to get there. And in a game, you're intentionally restricting yourself to some more inefficient means. So if you're running a marathon, right, you could take a shortcut. You could take a lift. You could steal a bicycle. You could get to the finish line first by shooting everyone else's kneecaps out. But when you're running a marathon, you don't do those things because what you want is to go through the particular struggle of this long right, route by uh, using your legs and running. Same thing with basketball, right? Like the point of basketball isn't just to get the ball through the hoop because you could do that easily with a stepladder right? A basketball game puts off stepladders, forces you to obey these rules, and creates this much more rich and complex particular activity, particular struggle. So Suta's idea is that part of a way to think about a game is that what you're trying to do is not just kind of an ordinary state of affairs in the world. It's a particular activity that's constructed by a particular set of constraints. So again, Look, if I just want so if I just want to be at that point near the park where the marathon people are going, just because I want like cookies that are sold there, like there's a good bakery <laughs> at that point, I'll take any right. It doesn't matter. I'll take shortcuts. I'll take the easiest and quickest way to get there. Right? What a marathoner wants to do is, if they take a shortcut, they haven't run the marathon. Right? They haven't crossed the finish line unless they went the long way. So games are things where the goal is partially constituted by a certain set of constraints. Does that make sense? It does make sense. You know, you're making me think of Rosie Ruiz. She was the, I think she was a Cuban American. I think she's now thought of as a fraudster because she was declared the winner. Do you remember this? It was, what year was it? It was 1980. It was the Boston Marathon. I'm checking in now, but 
she basically, I think she took a shortcut to the finish line. Right. I mean, I guess in some senses, Rosie Ruiz was playing her own game. It was just a, d- a different game. Or really, she wasn't playing the game because she wasn't playing by the rules. And T, that's something that recurs. Uh, we're going to use that word a lot in our time together this week, the word rule and rules. It seems to me games games have rules. That's like one of the things that make up games. Yeah, this is crucial, right? What Bernard Toot says is that uh, a cheater creates the appearance of a win, but they haven't actually won, right? Because they haven't done it in the proper way. Maybe they're doing it for status. And I think he thinks that sometimes people just misunderstand what the point is. They don't understand that the point of a game is to go through this difficult activity. So one more important thing is that the constraints and rules are voluntary. So Suits has this great moment where he says, look, here's another thing we're doing where we're constrained by rules, morality, right? But morality, if you believe in it, those rules are necessary. You have to follow them. Games are these things where you add extra unnecessary rules. So the point of them, he thinks, has to be that the rules create this kind of structured, interesting, difficult activity. Now, I'm kind of bleeding in my own language now. Um, yeah, so that's, so the rules are, so it's constraints, but it's also required constraints. So if you are in, I mean, if you're investing and you're following certain rules because you don't want to go to jail, that's not a game. If you are walking up a mountain and you're following certain rules because it'll make your walk more interesting and rich, that's a game. Yeah. And that's a really important point. Rules exist outside of games, but rules seem fundamental to games because they throw up the hurdles that make a game into a game. Uh, I also think about win-loss conditions. That feels to me true of most games I can think of. I do remember a really bad game. I think it was called the Un-Game. At one point, I had a boxed version of it when I was like 10 and the mid seventies, and it really it was it was trying to be the ungame, but I it I don't remember it being fun, and I don't certainly don't remember whether you could win or lose. I I do think winning and losing matters a lot, but whether or not you'd agree, T, I know one thing we need to talk about next is that games very often have scores, and that itself changes the nature of our activity within a game. I think not all games have scores. What all games have is a goal, and some games have a score. So one way to put it in the Sutian sense is that a game is, I mean, a game is telling you what you're trying to do, right? A game is giving you a direction to go. Uh, Sometimes that's specified with a score. And a lot of times the way that the goal is expressed is through a score or a win condition, but that's not always, uh, always the way. So there are a lot of, I think, aesthetic games. So think about uh, skateboarders trying to do the coolest trick or surfers trying to do the loveliest run, right? I think there's a case where there's a goal, but there's not exactly a win-loss condition and it's not clear enough to have a score, right? And in fact, you might come away. I mean, you could all go to the park and skate and all have the goal of doing the coolest trick and you might not agree about who did it, even though you have the same goal. One of the things you actually see in the history of skateboarding is in the movement from uh, kind of, free form hangout skateboarding to like official ESPN skateboarding is that the goal shifts a little to admit of basically objective scoring. And it looks like one of the places where you need to have a score and a clear decision procedure to tell you who won is when you need to declare a single winner in some official circumstance. But you can like, I mean, so my friends and I play this game. I mean, I think this is obviously a game, uh, Everyone brings random ingredients. We all get drunk and we each improvise a dish together and we try to make the best (laughs) dish, right? It's definitely a game. We're definitely competing. Everyone walks away with a, I mean, you don't have to agree in that case, right? About who won, but you're still playing. You know the goal, you know, the goal. And I, I get that. So, so games have impediments. We might call rules. Games have goals. I certainly agree. Not every game has a score. But I know that how we score games or how we set the goal is so fundamental to how the game is played. And two years ago, yep. this month, in fact, I had, and I know it's somebody you admire, a friend of mine, Reiner Knizia, join us on this podcast. Reiner said or wrote something years ago that made a real impression on you, T. What was that? So let me give you a little background. So what 
So I was working, I, I was starting to do uh, philosophy of art, which is not really a thing you're supposed to do anymore because it's a dying part of the world. We could talk about okay. that. I think, I think it's not just in philosophy. I think the world cares less about art. Whatever. Aww. Okay. So I'm trying to talk about what games are. And I read a bunch of stuff. And all of that stuff talked about games as a kind of fiction or a kind of movie, a very special kind of movie that used graphics in an interactive way. And you could read all of these books talking about why games were amazing. And they would never talk about skill or difficulty or choice, right? What they would talk about is characters and fiction and dialogue. And that's all in games. It's true that there are plenty of video games that have very cinematic narratives, but I also felt like it was missing something. And one of the things you know from the history of art is that when a new art form comes around, right, people always try to squish it into the box and the theory from the old art form and make like, I don't know, try to force photography to look like impressionist paintings and stuff. And and also, these things are always going to corrupt us, and it's generally the youth that will. And I remember that novels were going to – fiction was going to corrupt, corrupt specifically young women and right. give, them, give Every... them some fancy notions. Video games, I mean, how much has been said about video games that's negative? Right. Um, I – I, I don't know for sure, but I would place a bet that every single new artistic medium that comes about, there's going to be some group of people being like, oh my God, it's going to destroy the the youth and the morality of the nation or whatever. Um, so, what, so, so let's go back. So what Knizia said in this uh, game developer talk that blew my mind was, he said the most important tool in the game designer's toolbox is the scoring system because the scoring system sets the player's motivations. It tells the players what to want in the game. And as a game player, like this makes perfect sense, right? You open the box and it tells you, oh, you're collecting sheep. Oh, you're trying to kill the other side. Oh, you're all cooperating to stop the pandemic, right? You just, I mean, think about this. You, I often play board games with my wife. We get a new one and I've forgotten what it is. We open it and the game literally tells us whether we're trying to kill each other or cooperate, (laughs) right? We just learn the basic structure of our relationship from the game and we just execute it. And in some sense, this is completely natural as a game player. And in some sense, as a philosopher who studies this stuff, my response is, oh my God, what? Like, I was like, (laughs) that's correct. And that's completely surprising, right? That we can just have this thing and we can talk, we'll talk about later. There's a creepy side to this too, right? Where you just give a point system to people and everyone just orients themselves and says, yes, that's what I'm going to try to do. We're very fluid. So one of the things I think this teaches us is that we as human beings have very fluid desires. We can literally do this thing where someone writes a point system in a rule set and we can be like, I'm on it. And then all of our desires and cares change in a second. So the, the, but what I ended up saying in the book um, is that this teaches us what games actually are. What they are is the art form that works in the medium of agency itself. And what that means for me is that it's not just that a game designer creates a world. They do. It's not just that a game designer creates abilities. They do. They tell you what you want. They give you a package of abilities and, the, and ways to achieve things and a goal together. They're sculpting an agency for you to step into. I think what they're doing with that is shaping, using an agential language to shape interesting and rich activity, right? You, you take up a game and it tells you, okay, you are, so I'm a rock climber, right? You are trying to get to the top of this cliff and you're not allowed to use, you're not allowed to pull on the rope. All you can do is use your hands and feet on the cliff and here's the kind of cliff you should attack. And suddenly you've created this incredibly rich, subtle, absorbed form of movement that you wouldn't have been doing before, right? If you didn't have the restrictions of rock climbing, you just walk up the path on the back or you just throw a rope around a tree and haul yourself up the rope, right? It's the restrictions, the goal, and the environment together that shape this, like, when it's good, something fascinating and lovely. You know, I first heard about your work a couple of years ago. It was probably right around when your book came out. It was 2021. You were talking some, and and I'd love for you to do so now, a little bit about John Dewey, the American philosopher and educator, his view of art, art crystallizing our experience of each of our human senses or capabilities. So 
I'll just start you a little bit because I know what you'll yeah. say. So I'll just start you by saying that uh, for Dewey, apparently, and I'm not that familiar with his work, I remember some of the cultural literacy, E.D. Hirsch kind of stuff going on in the 1990s around this. But anyway, Dewey says that what is painting except a crystallization? Just the beauty, the quintessence of sight, of human sight. And what is music except the same thing for our hearing, of course? And T, you went on to say, what are games? Except the crystallization of action itself. I mean, one of the things that Dewey is really interested in is that art isn't this like weird exception from life. He thought that life had these kind of natural aesthetic richnesses, beauties and graces and elegance and wonders and thrills. And that art just took those, found kind of like natural unities and then concentrated them. So, right. You're looking around the world. Things are beautiful or sublime or gloomy or intense. And a painting or photographs accentuates a certain part of that, like crystallizes that little bit and finds a kind of nugget that we can carry around with that. Same with thing with fiction, right? It, there's this natural thing we tell of storytelling. And it's not like fiction is some weird, new, completely original invention. It is taking the things that happen in storytelling and extracting the most intense, wonderful parts and crystallizing them. I think the same thing. So like with games, right? Like there are all these things we do in ordinary life. Like one of my favorite things in life to do um, is pack too much stuff into a van. If you had this experience, like when I was a college <laughs> student, right? There's just all this junk and you're like, I couldn't possibly fit it. And then you like, you're like, oh, uh, let me rotate the couch this way. And if I get the lamp, like just the right, oh my God, I've got like, oh, it's all in. And normally you would only get to do that A, once in a rare while. And B, it would also be super stressful and miserable as you're doing it. But then someone makes Tetris, right? And Tetris just concentrates and extracts that particular pleasure and satisfaction. Um, so, so I think like we feel it all the time. We feel like I remember like, you know, uh, at a bar, like someone got really mad at me and they threw a punch at me and I just like dodged perfectly. And I got that thrill once in my life, but if you want it all the time, right. <laughs> go to martial arts trainings, box. You can, you can create a circumstance that accentuates the intensity and likeliness of that kind of interesting action. This is one of the things, by the way, that makes games, I think, really different from other art forms uh, that we're familiar with. Um, I think a lot of other art forms, the thing that's beautiful or elegant is in the thing, like the movie. The movie is thrilling, right? The, the book is moving. The painting is overwhelming. But games are, I think, distinctive. If you try to look for the beauty in the game, you won't see all of it. I think games are a thing where they're shaped and designed for the beauty to emerge in you, right? Your movement, your ideas, your epiphany in chess, right? Your, when you're playing some complex, like, manipula incentive manipulation board game, and then you see just the subtle way you could re-incentivize everyone. Like especially if it's you. a discovery for you, especially if you all yeah. of a sudden have that aha moment right in the middle of the game. And really good games, T, I think, do that on a regular recurring basis. And, and great games reward replayability and deeper insight. You know, I think we have to talk about art a little bit because I think you've already started us. And this is this is where you started, apparently, your your academic career, where you thought you might you might go. I think what I want to say about art briefly is first of all, I am I'm a common fool. So I'm not um, studied, particularly steeped in this, but I have read some things over the course of time. And one of my favorites, and I'm curious if you've read this book, I wouldn't be surprised if you have, is came from the book Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, which was written in 1993. It's self a comic book. And no. I really, okay, good. So I really enjoyed McCloud because what he does, um, this is even like a throwaway page or two. This is not the point of Understanding Comics. But what I remember anyway is at one point he talks about what is art. And in so many words, or in this case, comic strips, um, he says, art is not procreation, which we do to survive as a species. It's not eating, because that's also what we need to do to survive as individuals, but it's it's almost everything else. And so he, in my mind, and I, I may be slightly misquoting, this is my memory of a book I read two decades ago, but in my mind, he opened up this idea, for me anyway, that art is almost everything if you view art as, well, the word I just chose to say, 
was a choice. I chose that word, diction, not that other word. And what I'm wearing today, what I chose to wear today was a choice. And how I chose to build this framework within my business, that itself was a creative act. And so at least for me, I feel as if agency is so human and it's so constant. It's all around us with everything that we do. Art has already happened in the first 20 minutes of the podcast this week. So I I guess I want to ask you, T, first of all, how much are you on board with with that concept? And then if you're totally on board with that concept, which I kind of hope you're not, it starts begging the question, what isn't art? So there's a sense in which McLeod's comment is on the side that I'm on, right? There's a there's a way of thinking where you think, look, art has to be different from the world. It has to be completely distinct. There's something that makes art um that makes precious. aesthetic experience and artistic experience like completely sui generis, completely precious, not the kind of thing you'd encounter in everyday life. And I'm I'm on the side of Dewey, right? It's not weird that you see beauty in paintings and walking around in the mountains, right? That's there there is a continuity, there's a basic continuity there. So there's something that McLeod th- says I think that's incredibly important, but um so I, I don't have this perfectly in memory, but if your recreation is right, it makes this account a little too broad on the, in the right space, but a little too broad. So there's this notion in philosophy of activity that's autotelic. That means activity that's worth doing for its own sake. So you can loosely distinguish between instrumental activity and autotelic activity. Instrumental activity is the stuff you do to get something else you need. Right. If you work the job just to get the money, if you're hunting just to get the food, right? Um, if you're exercising just to get fitter, autotelic activity is the activity that you do for its own sake. And I think for a lot of people, not everyone, part of what makes art art is that it's valuable autotelically, right? That the point of art is not just to learn something or get better or invest. But the point of art is that the engagement is one in which looking for its own sake, right? Listening, hearing a story is valuable in its own sake or doing the action is valuable in its own sake. Again, this isn't going to strongly differentiate art from life. But I I think like art's just the stuff you make to concentrate that, right? Some looking around the world is really valuable for itself. And then art is the stuff made for you to look, right? Right for its own sake. And you can find physical movement or intellectual activity valuable for its own sake in life, but games are the stuff where you've like tuned the entire system just to accentuate that. that that's, what, that's, that's the Dewey in answer. Um, and I think there's one more thing you said where McLeod is so right on uh, and what is one of the most interesting things. So I used to I used to think there was nothing valuable in the art versus non-art distinction debate, like that it was a really boring part of philosophy. And then I found the most interesting stuff actually in the literature about art versus porn. Like what's the distinction between art and porn? Um, and one of my favorite philosophers, Anne Eaton, this incredible feminist philosopher of art, has this moment where she says, so there's this old account that what makes something porn is that it's demeaning or objectifying of women. And she says, that can't be right because there's plenty of art in the museum that's also misogynist, demeaning, and objectifying. So that can't be the right definition. So what is the difference between art and porn? And there's this really interesting old tradition that you can draw on. So people talk about the difference between sentimentalism and kitsch and then art. And at first you might think this is super elitist, but the actual account is really interesting. So what it looks like is sentimental stuff is stuff that you go to looking for a particular mechanical relationship. You want a tearjerker, right? It'll make you cry. You know what you want and it gives you what you want, right? So one way to put it um, is the way that Jerry Levinson, who is a philosopher of art who writes in this space, puts it is uh, if you take it to porn, what porn is, is you want it to give you a certain mechanical effect, like you want to be stimulated in a certain way, and you don't care how it does it, right? You are, the way he puts it is, you don't care what the technique is, right? You just want the thing at the end. With art, he says you care about how the subtleties of technique that got you to a certain effect. Another way to put it uh, that other people in the space have said is something like, look, with 
with porn or with sentimentalism, you know the emotion or feeling that's going to be provoked. With art, you don't. You're open, right? You're interested. So you can, does that make sense? So there's this kind of stimu- like mechanical stimulus response relationship in sentimentalism and porn. And with art, you're open both to like seeing new te- interesting ways that the medium was used to get some effect. It matters how either a painter made a certain line or a game designer put down a particular rule. And you're open to new kinds of experience and beauty that you haven't seen before. I really appreciate that definition and that distinction. And you've given me a new word, autotelic. I suspect many of our listeners have a have a new word this week, T. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I want to go two directions here, and yet I want to get to investing in business, which is a third direction. So reel me back in, but briefly, let's let's trot down the, the primrose path and uh, off the path briefly and then come back. So one of those directions is um, video games because – while you and I are going to probably talk more about tabletop games, and there's a weekend extra that's going to be about tabletop games that I'm looking forward to mentioning a little bit later in the show that will be coming up this weekend, very tabletop game focused. But in a lot of ways, video games, and I've had this discussion with my sons who are also video gamers like me, we saw, and I don't think it's unique to us. I'm sure it's out there in the literature, but you know, are video games actually the highest form of art in the sense that they combine agency very explicitly. Like, I almost was bored watching Avatar The Way of Water because at different points in those long action scenes, I was almost falling asleep. And my wife is like, how can you be falling asleep? And I was like, well, the reason is because I can't play this. I just have to sit there and watch this happen, and I can't play it. So you already have agency, but then you also have sound and visuals, and you have so much that immerses you within video games. So there's a little bit of the... What do you think of video games as high, high art? And let's not go too long on this, but what's your take? So I, I can't see any reason why video games couldn't be one of the highest forms of art. But I mean, again, I think you have to think like, um, I think Sturgeon's rule is really u- useful here. So do you know Sturgeon's rule? So Sturgeon no. was, a uh, Theodore Sturgeon was a sci-fi writer. And someone said like, why is 90% of sci-fi crap? And his response was, well, 90% of everything is crap. (laughs) And I think like one of the things that happens is people will compare super boring corporate product in video games with like the most interesting, like fancy high art film. And that's not like every realm has its corporate crap and it's dumb stuff and it's sentimental junk. And then there's this little realm of like, interesting neat stuff but i'm not gonna i'm i will 100 percent resist the claim that it's the highest because um i mean i think every art form does i mean try this argument hey comics are better than painting because they add words too that's like <laughs> I, I don't think games are better than movies because they add stuff to movies i think every art form holds something fixed and that leads you into a particular place. And you get something mm. different from each thing, right? So I think, for example, with non-interactive fiction, someone can sculpt a precise storyline better for you to appreciate. And with games, something else is going to happen, right? The storyline can't be as precisely sculpted. Instead, you get to interact, right? So you, you, the game designer isn't, except in particular cases, going to give you as finely tuned a specific storyline. Instead, they're going to give you an opportunity to act. It's not like, I mean... Imagine someone saying like, look, you know, Van Gogh would have been a lot better if he could have been animated, right? That Like each <laughs> form fixes a particular thing and you get to have that experience based on what the artist controlled. And it's great that in some cases people are fixing a, a visual appearance or a musical sound, right? So, yeah. Uh, you know, I love that that question, T, gave you an opportunity to relive your early days as a philosopher of art. Apparently a dying area of the philosophy, but we got to go there a little bit. And I said there was one other brief distraction before we get back on, on track. And let me just read you this Helena Bonham Carter quote. You may have come across this one before. My sister forwarded this to me last month, and she said, this is how our mom felt. This is such a beautiful quote. You don't have to agree or like my mom, my sister, or this quote. I'm just curious. It it speaks to this conversation and it leaves me still slightly confused. So 
tie up this loose end. Here's the Bonham Carter quote. I think everything in life is art, she said. What you do, how you dress, the way you love someone, and how you talk, your smile and your personality, what you believe in, and all your dreams, the way you drink tea, how you decorate your home or party, your grocery list, the food you make, how your writing looks, and the way you feel. Life is art, end quote. I'm almost on board, but I think that's a little too optimistic. So (laughs) I would buy that if you changed it to could be. Everything in life could be art, right? There's no part of life that couldn't be taken up with the aesthetic attitude for the reason of finding beauty and richness or expression, like all those qualities. But I think every, every, everything can also be done in a crappy unthought. I mean, part of what was going on in our conversation with before talking about McLeod and talking about the porn stuff is that what makes something, what seems to unite a lot of art is every detail matters, right? You don't just ignore some of the junk. It's like Mm. the way Miles Davis plays every single note, like every stop that matters, right? The way when gay, when a game is art, I think like every single detail, about the graphics, the music, the opportunities, like all of that is potentially expressive. And I think like, yes, sometimes when you cook, you can be trying to find aesthetic richness and expression and like all the beauty that's possible with food. Or you can be cramming protein bars into your face after a lift to feed. And that, I think, is a not, that's not an autotelic relationship. <laughs> that's a relationship of pure instrumentality. Instrumentality, so, yep. Right? It's, you're just trying to use it to get some outcome out of it. You don't care about the particulars or the details. This is such an important distinction. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think everything in life is art. I think most of things in life, including games and film, are instrumental crap. But <laughs> everything could be. Everything right? could be art. I really appreciate that distinction. Let's briefly talk about fun. So I, I'm a sometime listener of the Tabletop Gaming Podcast, Two Wood for a Wheat. One of the things the hosts who reviews board games on the, on the podcast, the hosts inveigh against is reviewers and reviews that label games as fun. Fun, because, well, that doesn't really explain anything or help people figure out if it's a game they'd like, if it would be fun for them. But that said, fun. But then on the other side, there's, there's a small industry in the book trade dedicated to creating fun, even just in the workplace alone. Titles like The Power of Fun, Fun at Work, 300 Ways to Have Fun at Work, etc. As long as you'll let me ask you really simple, potentially very deep questions, T, what is fun? I have no idea. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or I should say, I think... I can know a lot of examples, but as a philosopher who's supposed to give definitions, uh, I've tried to define fun for a decade and failed. Like that's it's incredibly difficult. Suits gave us a good definition of games. There's a there are a couple accounts of play that I find plausible, but fun is so hard. But one thing I should say is I totally get and I get I, I'm of two minds about this resistance to fun. So I understand what the resistance is so one there there are two forms of the resistance one if fun is kind of your generic kind of like praise for any game then it's contentless as uh as your reviewers say i think there's something else which is wanting things to be pleasurable in the simplest way is kind of a barrier to like the wideness of something as an art form, right? Like I think with film, like if you're an artsy film person, you don't just say, Oh, I go to the films that are fun. You think, Oh, there's all this stuff that film can do, right? It can be sad. It can be evocative. It can be expressive. It can like show the pain of a particular person situation in life. Like look at the wideness and of the potential. And if you just want movies to be fun, then you've emptied out a lot of that potential. And I think a lot of games and a lot of the games that I find the most interesting, they're not necessarily fun. There are games that I, they're especially like the world of indie tabletop role-playing game, games right now. They're full of the, so there's this game I'm fascinated with called The Quiet Year, which is this cooperative game where you co-tell the story of a village surviving for a year 
after the apocalypse struggling and where that games takes you is to this like place of like spooky, sad, intimate sorrow. It's not. I, so my students, so I run a game design class at the university of Utah, uh, uh, game design program. And I have my students play this. No one thinks it's fun. Everyone thinks it's one of the best experiences they've had. They think they think it's like it's deep, it's rich, it's evocative, it's sorrowful, it's moving. No one says fun. So I think that's really I totally understand that resistance. On the other side, I do think that ga- one of the reasons that games get um crapped on is because people don't respect fun enough. And games are really good at making things fun. Like, especially like there are a bunch of games I have that are just the easiest and most reliable route to like relaxed hilarity. And I don't, it's like a design miracle. Like there are these party games, like Spyfall is this incredible party game. Every time I played it, the whole, and code names, right? These are games where you can just render a group of uncomfortable, distant, stiff strangers into this like warm, (laughs) convivial social. And like, I mean, in some sense, I think that's, I think those are master artworks and what these game designers are doing with games like code names is like they're playing our sociality like a violin, right? So like think about how the hell did someone design something where I can find any group of people, strangers, friends, any level of discomfort. And almost always it renders them into like friendly, happy, laughing people like that's a miracle. It really is. And it's so beautiful the way you said that. And those are games that certainly I'm familiar with. And in in some cases I've talked about on this podcast over the years, games that take five minutes to teach and welcome everybody, usually of all ages, and and give them an experience that's meaningful. We just played a game called Wavelength. Have you played Wavelength? No. We just played, I think you'd really enjoy it. It's it's right in that same genre of bring strangers together. But Wavelength simply has... One person puts a card up on the table and it'll say, boring, stimulating. And so you're thinking about a spectrum. And then unbeknownst to the people he'll, he'll be giving the clue to, he sees a visual behind a, a, a hidden window of where on the spectrum the actual answer is. And I, I'm waving my hands around. You can see me doing this, but podcast listeners can't so maybe this is a little confusing but basically behind a hidden window you see 180 degrees of a circle and somewhere in that 180 degrees you're going to see like the sweet spot and you're trying to give a clue a a word or a phrase to your teammates who don't know where that is that's going to nail boring to stimulating and if for some reason let's just say it's like five eighths of the way toward boring then you're going to need to think of something not terribly boring but something that's kind of boring enough. And so you might say something like, I don't know, going for a walk, going for a random walk. Anyway, that is an example of a game like Codenames, like Dixit, like Spyfall, which is a little bit more hilarious, of games that create a small miracle. They they do indeed knit us together and provide us that moment. And I do find face-to-face that I, I prefer Codenames to the beautiful Codenames.game website, which has some advantages. T, we don't even need to go there, but there's the whole, are we in person playing this with friends and family, or are we trying to win it all on the internet? Both are different experiences. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the games... So first of all, I think people who look at games often overemphasize the incredibly arcane complex games, which I also love, but some of the, if you look at game designer diaries, these elegant little party games are actually the hardest to design because you have so few rules to play with. I mean, sometimes I think of them as like haiku or sushi or something where like the amazingness is you can get so much out of this little minimal rule set. Um, The, I have my students play The Mind, which is a really interesting game. Do you know The Mind? I do. Yeah, The Mind is a game where uh, a group of people are given a randomly distributed set of numbered cards from 1 to 100. They have to cooperate to play them in order, but they cannot talk or signal in any way. So it's about developing this like intimate sense of timing. And a lot of these games, the Codenames and Spyfall and the mind uh, are all interestingly games that constrain communication in a particular way. And they try to get you to create some kind of empathy or near telepathy, or you package too much information into like this little thin package. And to do that, you have to like 
get inside someone's mind. And this is one of the things I found really interesting. There's both a set of cooperative games and a set of competitive games where wh- what you get out of it is like, you get so close to somebody else's mind. I think in some ways, weirdly, the most mental intimacy you might have is playing chess against someone. Because if you block a move of theirs, 10, if you make a move, because you see they have a 10 move sequence and you block it, you're there, you're, both of you are in the same 10 move <laughs> sequence, right? And I think one of the things that's doing this, one of the incredible things about games, and also this is going to be turn out to be worrisome later, one of the incredible things about games is the art, the environments are so artificially simplified, right? There's so few moves possible and the goals are so clear. And that's what enables this kind of like near telepathy, right? That you're operating in such a clean, minimal environment together. So let's talk a little bit about abstraction because that's sort of happening with games. After all, a game designer decides to create along a theme, some kind of a rule set, which if, if you and I read the rules, and I'm always the one in my gaming group who does. I, I buy games sometimes just to read the 32-page rule book, and it doesn't even make sense because these days they're all on PDF, but I still buy the game. Still in shrink wrap in many cases, but I'm going to open it. I, I at least want to read the rule book. So you have somebody who's thought through a system, and if it's published, if it's a good game, it's not a breakable system. It, you don't obviously always choose four or always pick wheat. You're actually going to think through each time you play the game how you're going to maybe play the game differently, maybe based on the conditions. But anyway, what's being done is we're abstracting reality. We are simplifying in the same way that comics, in a lot of ways, abstract uh, the visual world around us. Um, That's what game designers are doing. And then they say, along with Kinesia, hey, here's how we're scoring. Here's the goal. Here here are the points for this, this particular game. And so that's why, in some ways, we're given agency within a simplified, abstracted world. And as I know you're somebody who loves hundreds of different games, and I am also that geeky, and most people listening to us are not anywhere near that geeky, so let's not geek out too much. But I think part of what I love about games so much is that there are so many different ones. And in my mind, there was like Monopoly. I'm making up uh, 1933, Charles Darrow. I'm even making up that name. I don't think I have that right. But then, you know, five years later, I'm making this up again. Parcheesi shows up, but there were no games in between 1933 and 1938. And then all of a sudden, we reach the 1980s and 90s. Uh, This is post Avalon Hill War Games, which was sort of an efflorescence. But in the last 20 years, it has absolutely exploded. The choices that we have, the abstractions we can seek, And T, this is where we're headed now. And I know you want to say something to that, and you can, but I'm even going to push us forward to social media platforms, which are also abstracted forms of experience that a lot of people, far more than play Catan, are opting into. And those have their own rules as well when you start to really think about it, like you have. Yeah. So... Thank you for giving me the lead. He he knows that I've written a paper called How Twitter Gamifies Communication and that he can just prod me and I'll rant. Well, and a lot of people listening use Twitter. A lot of people on this podcast use Twitter actively. So this is very relevant to us. Yeah. So here's – this is, I think, a really good place to see the difference between games and game-like systems in the world. So games, I think, give you – one of the crucial abstractions is the value system. Games give you abstracted, simplified value systems, right? In ordinary life, your values are super complicated. They're super rich. Like it's hard, you know, I care about research. I care about my family. I care about health. I care about fun. And it's like, it's hard to quantify them and measure them off against each other, right? Like, What's your, what's you your know, score as a dad? <laughs> I just, how I mean, did you score it, last month? And it's also like, I mean, it's not just that they're hard to compare against each other, even a single one. Like it's, if you're, if you're being careful and thoughtful about it, it's actually really hard to tell, right? Like, I mean, I think about this parenting, right? You let your kid off the hook some night, they're screaming and they're telling stories and it's too late and they should have gone to bed, but they're having a great time. And you're like, was that Am good? I succeeding or failing? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? And in games, you get something very different. So in scored games, you get a clear mechanistic decision procedure that tells you exactly how to apply 
the value system to know exactly how well you've done. And everyone's on the same one. So what you get is value clarity. So one of, one of the things that I think happens in games, or one of the things that makes them so appealing, is that in life, we have these rich, inchoate, nauseating, complex value decisions, and then we get a break from them, right? Games are just like existential dessert, where you get to like be soothed by the experience of knowing for once in your life exactly where you're going. So this is, ex- this is part of why I'm really worried about gamification. So there are a lot of people who are very pro, like, oh, let's make life like a game. You, games are awesome, so let's make life more awesome. But to do that, you have to offer a simplified, mechanically applicable scoring system. And in real life, values are much more complicated. So Twitter for me is this remarkable example where there are all these possible values for communication empathy, connection, information. And then Twitter gives you the scoring system that measures one thing, which is popularity. (laughs) And if you let it in, and if you get thrilled by it, then what's going to happen is that you will have gotten game-like pleasures in exchange for simplifying your communicative value system to get into line with something that can be measured by a simple mechanism at mass scale. So the next book I'm writing right now is about this. I'm, I'm worried about this thing that I'm calling value capture, about when your values get captured by clear institutional metrics. And the best way of putting the worry for me is that you're outsourcing your values. Instead of being engaged in something and figuring out whether it's worthwhile for you, whether it matches with your value, with your place, with your personality, you're just like, okay, you're literally buying your values off the rack, right? Here's what I'm going to do with Twitter. I'm going to aim at what it measures. Here's what I'm going to do with fitness, right? I don't think you don't have to be like this. You don't like, you're not instantly captured the moment you put on a Fitbit or start using Twitter, but I think it just beckons. And I, I experience this all the time. Like I'm very vulnerable to this. And so I constantly have to fight. Like a few times I've gone viral on Twitter and each time I've had to delete Twitter from my phone because my brain gets so infected with the desire to like score more points, right? That I just start trying to re-aim my thoughts for the kinds of things that will score well. And I think when you're oriented that way towards Twitter, you have been captured by the simplified value system. It's it's really so compelling and I think so important for our self-awareness. And one of the things I appreciate about your work, other than you're often talking about games and game designers I know or games that I love, is that you're helping us get above the game. And I kind of led off this week by by talking about that at a meta game level. I mean, are we in some games that we don't even realize we're playing as individuals and also as a society. Do you have other examples in mind to scare us with or provoke us with? Oh, yeah. So Let's do it. Um, okay. So let me take a step back. There's a, cr- there's a crucial bit from my book that I need to talk about um, that uh, is going to be important for going on. So in a game, the goal is something that's constituted by the constraints where you get the struggle, right? So what, why are you doing it? So one of the things that I think Bernard Suits makes clear is there are at least two different motivations for playing a game. Uh, And this is, this is for this, he didn't spell this out. And I think this is the most, for me, the, I feel like the most important thing I figured out thinking about Suits. So the two motivations I call achievement play and striving play. So achievement play is playing a game because winning is valuable to you. And striving play is temporarily taking on an interest in winning because the struggle is valuable to you, right? So does that make sense? So striving play in particular, you might think of this. In normal life, we're engaging instrumentally. We're taking the means for the sake of the ends. In striving play, our motivations are inverted. We're taking the ends for the sake of the means, right? We're taking on a goal because the activity of pursuing that goal is valuable. So... One of the things I think that happens with games, I think a lot, by the way, oh, I should give the argument. So some people have doubted that striving play is real. And here's my argument. Consider the category of stupid games. A stupid game is a game where the fun part is failing, but it's only fun if you are trying to win. Like Twister, right? Or Telephone, 
or a lot of drinking games. So there's a case where actually what you want is to fail. That's the fun part. But in order to get it, you actually have to try. Like if you fall over on purpose, it's not funny, right? (laughs) Because what's funny is failure. Yeah, you've just given examples of very accessible games. I was just thinking about Galaxy Trucker. Have you played Galaxy Trucker? I love Galaxy Trucker. So Galaxy Trucker is a stupid game. That is one of the few games that actually takes about 30 minutes to teach and is a deeper uh, strategy game where you act, it is actually more fun in a lot of ways right. to watch your ship that you've carefully built on a timer get blown apart by unforeseen events and circumstances and laugh as everybody else's does. And winning doesn't seem to matter as much, even though it still counts. Anyway, keep going. Here's our psychic connection. Galaxy Trucker was one of my natural examples. That one, one of the ones that I got to thinking of. I didn't use it in the book because only weirdo geeks like us know <laughs> right. Galaxy Trucker. <laughs> it's so good. Um, it, it is. It but is. yeah. But I also think this is also true of some more complicated games. It's fun to see the wheels come off. But okay. So here's a way that you can ga- engage in games well. You play a game. And then you, if you're a striving player, you step back and you ask, was the activity worth it? Was the struggle fun? Was the struggle interesting? And kind of the bad way to play games is to play a game and just get sucked into the win, even if the struggle sucks. And this is actually my worry about a lot of real world systems, because With games, at least, there's a natural built-in moment where you step away from the game and you decide whether you're going to play it again. Think with a lot of real-world systems. And the ones I'm worried about things are like GPA, the ranking of what college you got into, your your Twitter likes, right? Right. We're not even just talking about like kids' mobile games making you wait 15 minutes to take your next shot or you can pay a buck now. You're talking about real-world systems that have been around for a long time. GPA. Um, Yeah. I think... One of the worries is that you can get sucked into a game like that as a game that is just pursuing those points and not realize that the actual process sucks, that it's, that it's empty of life, that it is boring or awful. Um, and part of it is because my suspicion is that a lot of the times we don't have the opportunity to step back and ask the question that I think games make prominent, which is, was the pursuit of these points actually a worthwhile way of living? Should we play something else? One of the things that makes it easier in games is you get, a cho- as you said, there's massive choice. You get to engage in a kind of rich, aesthetic, personal decision. Did I play that game? Do I like, I like, I hate Catan. I think it's really boring compared to other games of that Stripe from that world, like all of Knizia's games. R- uh, Wolfgang Kramer's El Grande, which is one of the most interesting board games Fantastic ever made. Game. Right. Rich, juicy, thick decisions all the time. Right. But then I think when large scale systems in the world become like games, like GPA, there aren't alternatives or ways to step back. And so you can just get sucked into you this. You can't bad stop playing that game. game. Yeah. It's systemic. There are two problems. One is that there's this pervasive instrumentality. Sorry, I sound like such a philosopher. Like, (laughs) you can't, okay, every student is stuck with, okay, Uh, every student is stuck with GPA as something that employers will look at. So that's pervasive. But I think there's something even worse you can do that the pervasiveness encourages, which is to take GPA as the only purpose of your education, right? One of the things that games encourage is just kind of like, so I, I, I wish I had a better term for this. In the book, I call it all-out instrumentality. You take out, you look at a goal, and that's all that matters, and you just throw yourself at that goal. And in a game, that's okay, because games are thin, artificial, temporary environments. But if you approach your entire educational life, where the only goal is GPA, and you don't think about anything else, then you're thinning out a much richer activity. P.S. I have the same worry about money. And, and we're real near getting there. I, I, I want to talk some about investing in business. And this is going to be this is going to be a podcast that runs longer than my normal podcast. And yet we're not even going to get to half the stuff I'd like to. So that's a sign that I need to have you back, which I certainly will. This has been so much fun. Let me just talk some about like 
new games that we're that we're playing and it's because of the world of big data and i know that you've written a recent paper entitled i believe transparency is surveillance and if you'd like to speak about that some please do but for me anyway i am actively opting into all kinds of scoring systems that i really do love and i think they make me a better me so i'll give a quick two quick examples that come to mind one is my hydrate spark pro smart water bottle Every time I take a sip from it, it lets me know, oh, that's 1.2 ounces. Oh, good job. You're on your way to 71.2 ounces, your daily goal. Oh, wait, it's actually now 73.2 today because you just took a short walk, which means you need to hydrate a little bit more, and the humidity is lower than usual, so we're going to need you to have a little bit more water than that. And from one day to the next, I am hydrating. And I'm not just doing that, T, I don't know if you have one of these, but I've invited my friends and family. We have a water league. We all see how we're doing toward our goal. There's not really a race. And you can get, I think it's called something like hyponatremia, where you can overwater yourself and create dangerous conditions. They're not trying to do that. But I have actively opted in, and I am driven by a gamification tool that I know you know well, and that is streaks. I have a long streak where I've nailed my water goal from one day to the next. That example took a little while to explain. There's more to that. We could unpack that or skip it. But I also have my sleep. I actively measure my sleep. I wake up each morning. I'm like, oh, I was an 801 last night out of 1,000. That means basically I was 80th percentile of gentlemen around my age and weight and how we slept last night. And I, th I really en enjoy these things. I'm inviting them in. So I feel as if gamification is obviously like any powerful tool can be used for good, or for evil. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm certainly not going to block the resist the good of a fully controlled gamification. I mean, my worry is about not only imposed systems, but systems that sneak up on you without you realizing it, that discourage reflectiveness. Um, in some sense, when you decide because it makes your life better, that this gamification is good for you. That's, that's in some sense very similar to playing any other game. You've made a decision about an experience that you find worthwhile. I still have a worry, though, and the worry is about what kinds of activities in the current environment are easily gamifiable and which ones are not. And my worry is something like, look, water intake and sleep is easy to measure. Enjoying poetry is less easy to measure. Right? <laughs> Having an interesting conversation with your family is less easy to measure. And my worry is that if you're the kind of person that reacts to gamifications, then, I mean, you're choosing them, but you're also choosing from a limited supply of possible gamifications. There are kinds of things that gamify more easily. L let me try this. So... One of the worries I have in this transparency paper you're talking about is that there's a drift between what we actually care about and what's easy to measure at scale in an institution. And part of that drift is particularly because in transparency cases, um, the kind of metrics you use are constrained, further constrained by the need to be legible to the public. So Honor O'Neill, who got a philosopher, a bioethicist, and Kantian ethicist, who got me really interested in this, said, she has this moment that inspired this whole paper where she says, people think trust and transparency go together, but they're actually in tension because transparency asks experts to explain themselves to non-experts, but their real reasons aren't explicable to non-experts, so they have to lie. Um, my my worry is even worse that experts might only start doing the kinds of things that they can explain to non-experts, which actually constrains the kinds of reasons they can use and minimizes their expertise. So there are a lot of cases where I think the actual expert, like the art expert or the educational expert, has a sensitivity to an area that won't survive the demand for metrification. So one of the other worries I have to about the gamification cases is that even if it's under your choice, given the fact that the gamifications available range over activities that are easier to quickly metrify, then your attention is going to go to things like sleep and hydration and not to things like poetry and conversation. Mm. Like I really this, appreciate that. Does it make sense? There's this measurability constraint that I think is really important. You know, I, I, I'm reminded briefly of one of my probably 20 favorite movies, The Truman Show, because 
with no spoilers, but I mean, we all should have watched the Truman Show at this point. So I, I think I think it's fair to spoil this this movie. But there's Truman Burbank, the the protagonist, played by Jim Carrey, and he's living his life, not realizing that he's actually a reality TV show for the rest of the world. And the hilarity of, and also the troubling nature of the discovery that that is actually the case is in large part the movie The Truman Show. But I guess I'm thinking about it because in a way, he's sort of a microcosm of what we're talking about. Are we living a life not conscious of, well, being watched in the case of The Truman Show and maybe of big data today, but but more importantly, well, actually, T, have you seen this movie? Yeah, of course. Are are we in the Truman Show today? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are two worries I have about runaway gamification. And one of them, the answer is something like, you're in the Truman Show and you don't know it. And the other, it's something like, oh, it's actually worse if you think about, if you know that you're in a game. So l- let me try, let me try this. So I think there are lots of these targets that we have out there and it might be, Twitter likes. It might be money and investing in your investment, like how much you made. It might be in my world in academics. It's funny because academics will often be like, oh, I'm above money. But then they're targeting things like citation rates and impact factors for their publications or like page views for journalists, right? So one worry, let me, let me try. I just thought about this this morning. Let me try this distinction between bad games and evil games. Okay. Let's do it. See if this makes sense. I think a bad game is the thing we were talking about before where The game sucks for you if you play it. Like, it's boring, it's annoying, it makes your life worse, it makes you unhappy, but you're stuck in it because you don't realize it's a game, right? You don't realize that you have choice about what you're pursuing. And if you think, I have to be pursuing this, I have to be getting GP, I have to be getting more money, I have to be getting into a good college, even though it's making my life miserable, that, I think, that's the problem of being stuck in a bad game. And that, I think realizing that you're in a game and where that means you have choice, right? That's really powerful. You can be like, look, I've been pursuing this metric for a really long time and my life sucks. And what that looks like is I know people who like got really excited about having a lot of Instagram followers. At some point they realized their lives had gotten hollowed out and they tried to get out of that game. So that's one word. You know, that's such a good example. And just to throw out one other older movie that I'm thinking of that you just made me think, Logan's Run. I'm sure you've seen Logan's Run, T. Yeah. Yes. And I, that's kind of like you're living in a world that's a dystopia and all of a sudden you realize you can break out of it. No spoilers. <laughs> so the the flip worry, and I think this is a very different worry, is, okay, what makes real games morally okay is that they're separated from ordinary life. So because the points in a game are artificial and not directly connected to real life in most circumstances, then there's a, there's a safety mechanism, right? So one, one, of the, one of the first things I wrote about games is this account that looks like, look, if you're engaged in striving play and both of you are only trying to win for the pleasure of a struggle, right? Then in some sense, blocking somebody else's attempt to score That's not evil. That's good because you're helping them get what they want, which is the struggle. And part of what makes that okay is the points aren't valuable in and of themselves. They're just these temporary constructs that you get into to have this interesting struggle. Um, They're disattached from the rest of material reality. But investing isn't like that, right? Like one of the things that I worry about, about people that do anything for more Twitter likes or anything for more money, right, is that... If you treat it like a game, the game-like attitude is, it's okay to pay attention to nothing else and just max out my points. And that's okay in the secluded environment of real games. But insofar as the points that you're pursuing have real-world effects, like on Twitter, like with money and investing, then you don't have the same ethical, free, get-out-of-being-evil card that you have with Settlers of Catan or Monopoly, right? So my worry is actually in the investment space and in the Twitter space, the people that I find most worrying are those who self-consciously think of it as a game. Like, I'm just trying to win. I, these are my points. Like, I'm just playing the game and uh, not thinking about the fact that the things that they're calling points are attached to incredibly consequential 
material reality. Yeah, well, I, I hear you. And at least listeners of this podcast and anybody who's followed my work with Rule Breaker Investing for 30 years know that my guiding watchwords are make your portfolio reflect your best vision for our future. So um, I certainly, and I'm, I'm on the board of Conscious Capitalism, I, I think that it's integral. Everything is connected. And so what you invest in says so much, not just about who you are, though it does, but it also says so much about our future because we're shaping the future every day with our dollars. And by the way, that's true of investing. It's also true, of course, of our spending. Choosing to buy from this vendor, not that one. To pay this price, not that. To, to have this different experience. All of these are all about agency in many cases. There are places in the world where you only have one choice or you have no choices, which is really sad. But at least in America, we're blessed with so many choices, maybe too many choices sometimes. It can be overwhelming, but everything is connected. So to the extent that I think of investing as a game, which by the way, I do, and business is a game, it's partly, but what rules have I designed into the game that I'm playing as an entrepreneur at The Motley Fool or as somebody who's making his own portfolio. And I self-regulate against things that I think are evil or bad, or at least I'm doing my best, not just at my own level, but to anybody who listens to me, to counsel us to realize that you know, um, buying fair trade coffee, where you pay up a little bit more beyond what you could have had that cup of coffee for, actually gives a developing world farmer direct foreign aid, which is much more efficient than the U.S. trying to give the dictator of his or her country that aid, or even in many cases, the NGOs on the ground in that country, not all of which are particularly effective or always well motivated. So as an example, fair trade coffee, that is playing the game as a consumer differently than how other consumers do it. And at least a lot of my optimism, and you, you're joined today by an optimist, is rooted in the belief that along with Jefferson's great line, I can light your taper, you can light mine, and neither one of us loses anything as the as we let the light shine and we hit higher levels of consciousness and conscious doing. Yeah, I mean, th- let me. I I, I want to probe what you mean by game when you say that investing is a game. So let me say why I'm worried about treating investment like a game, and you can maybe we're picking up on different parts of the phenomena because the phenomena is really rich and complicated. So the part of the pleasure of a game for me is it's because it's detached from ordinary life. And because we're in this consensual space, you can just go all in on the point system. Games are a situation where you can min max, right? You can be a pure min maxing monster. You don't have to worry about anything else and you can you don't have to be get involved in the complicated thing of, oh, what are the later downstream effects on other people? You can just be this pure, instrumentalizing, optimizing, simple beast. Um, and I think that's the attitude that I would be worried about in investing. And the thing that you're talking about doesn't seem game-like to me in that respect. Like it is, I mean, I can see what you mean in the sense that there are aspects that you've put on to increase the striving pleasure, but you're also the thing you're describing to me involves co- not just settling on money as pure points and pure victory and nothing else matters, but opening yourself to the consequential downstream uh, consequences. And that, I mean, that seems great to me, but that attitude is the thing that makes me think you should be like that and not treat this as a pure game in the sense that I was talking about. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I almost feel like we're going into another podcast, like the one you should be hosting, having me on at some point, because I'd love to talk about that at a deeper level than we probably have time to. But I do want to say a few things back. First of all, for me anyway, when I think about games, um, I I almost start inside out with business first, and then investing is is one concentric circle outside of it. So as an entrepreneur, um, I think of business as a tremendous game. It has... Kinesia-like beauty in terms of some of the scoring mechanisms, uh, balance sheets, income statements, statements of cash flow, accounting, uh, accountants who actually force you to publish your numbers on a regular, transparent basis. Now, outside of like the accounting and the numbers of racking up not just profit, but a lot of other measures you can be playing toward, there's also the 
Well, but what are we doing in the real world? What are the effects of teaching more people about the stock market for good and for bad? Because it's not just all good or all bad. Um, and so I, I guess there's such richness in my own experience uh, helping to create and helping to run an organization where I can, I feel like I see so much of the game. I have almost a 360 degree view. Whereas one concentric circle away, I start having a narrower view. I can't see as much of the elephant now. And so the, the game there for me um, doesn't as clearly connect with real world effects hiring and firing, um, making your numbers or not, going public and having an incredible IPO or not. All of those things are much clearer and much more grounded in the world when you're running an organization or a university than if you're just their mom and pop armchair investor, which is also part of how I roll. And there, T, I would just say that I have formed up the game in this way. I am trying to beat the index funds. We live in a world where so much of academia, even still today, thinks it's a random walk down Wall Street and uh, you know monkeys throwing darts. And so the game of it for me, the game is on, game's afoot, when I know that there is an average and the vast majority of the world, even at the highest academic levels, think it is not possible sustainably to beat that. And that is incredibly motivating for me. And that's why I encourage everybody listening to always score how you're doing, uh, et cetera. And you know, what are the ways to play to win in that? But it's not necessarily, I don't know if this is helpful or not, or if I'm speaking to you or away from you. But for me, I guess a lot of it are the constraints that you set. It's the game that you put in place as an entrepreneur. You could be a jerk or not. You could think about all your stakeholders. You could just think about yourself. Same thing with your portfolio, what it does in the world, and even more than your portfolio, perhaps passing the ball back to you, how each of us is spending our money every day. Those things have real world effects and they're they're intimate and they're all about agency to me. The transcript will read long pause. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a problematic way to think about investing is a game when you get this all out instrumental attitude. And I think you're I pushing agree. on another side of this and what you're pushing on looks something like this. You can keep reflectively redesigning a game to get the kind of effects out of it you want. I think a lot of us engage in movement between fitness games and there are real world consequences for that, right? There are some things I find incredibly fun that actually trash my body. And I have to think at some point, I'm like, oh, I can't, right? I have to think about the <laughs> other effects. And there's some things that are very rich. And uh, there are some things that are really like healthy and are going to help me, but they suck so much that I'm never going to try to do them. And so what I'm trying to do is find and then kind of push around the design for me for something that is both rich and engaging and then has the right downstream effects. And so I can just throw myself into it. Right. So I think what you're saying, which is the hopeful side of this, is that you are imagining that it's possible to create an investment game and keep pushing it around. So it's both fun and interesting for you and also where the downstream consequences are better for the world. Like I, I, I would like to be optimistic enough to think that that's possible. Uh, I am worried given the history I know uh, about whether that's possible or not, but maybe, 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 maybe you're the, you know, economic moral saint we need to <laughs> make things less horrific. All right. Well, you know, it would be fun to keep going along that track, but I think we need to start bringing things to a close. And I thought let's close with a game. Will you play a game with me? Absolutely. Let's play our long-standing Motley Fool game of buy, sell, or hold. So I'll be asking you about things that are not stocks. But if they were stocks, T, would you be buying right now, selling, or holding? You ready? Uh, am I looking for financial value or cultural value or goodness? Like if I thought something wouldn't make me money. but That is the you know, right question, the and we're going to leave that rhetorical. <laughs> that is up to you. Okay, I love the question. Here we go. Chat GPT. Specifically, Chat GPT, buy, sell, or hold right now? Um, 
I'll hold because I'm torn between various things. You're talking to a teacher who thinks that getting students to write things for themselves is a deeply valuable procedure and Hell also yeah. has to write tons and tons of bureaucratic crap. So, you know, every <laughs> single one of us is like, oh my God, every single stupid year end report I have to write, I can use this for. And then we, at the same time, we all have to think like, the most valuable part of our intro class is to get students to write and think and put down their thoughts. And if they have a way to get around that, yeah. they might produce good writing, but they won't go through the process of struggling with their own words. And if you think that's valuable for critical thinking, like then, you know, whoa. Well said. All right. Next one up. Buy, sell, or hold, if it were a stock these days, academic tenure. <laughs> I want to buy, and I want to buy for forward-looking reasons. Um, Share. I'm going to buy to support. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the one of the values of tenure is that it gives people the freedom to explore outside of narrow constraints. And I actually worry right now. One of the things that's going on across the board in research is that. In the increasingly monitored and metrified uh, view of the research of the research world, um, people are being encouraged to take more and more safe bets, right? Things that will definitely pay off. And I think so. There's a really interesting piece of philosophy of science from a guy named Philip Kitcher about how healthy science incentivizes people both to some people to take short, high likelihood bets, and some people to take weird, wild, long shots. My worry right now is that the world is moving away from uh, incentivizing academic research on long shots, and tenure is a thing that protects long shots. Well said. All right, changing gears here. T, buy, sell, or hold the game Candyland? I will sell that. <laughs> Thank you. It's a long list of... <laughs> <laughs> that that is actually the most well known game that provides zero agency, literally no agency. You are picking up a card; it tells you to go ahead two blue spaces. You hope you're going forward, not backward. That's it. We have fixed Candyland previously on this podcast, thanks to one of my listeners writing in saying, "Hey, draw two cards and have your kid pick which one," and that actually adds all of a sudden the art, the agency. T. But anyway, thank you for your Candyland conversation. We did not talk about that ahead of time, but you are. More than welcome to return anytime to this podcast. Thank you. Next one. Buy, sell, or hold rock climbing if it were a stock. Uh, buy. Um, for also, I mean, I think it's an amazing thing. I discovered rock climbing. I'm excited more people have discovered rock climbing because I think the world is moving away from thinking that what fitness is, is you have to pound out some miles on a treadmill and hit your numbers and be miserable. And towards <laughs> thinking like, you can do this thing. It'll help you be healthy, but it's also like interesting and rich. And I'm, I think like more, as more people are moving to some of these, like more, I think there are more autotelic forms of fitness too, like surfing, climbing, things that are just delightful. I think that's good. And I now know exactly what you're saying. And I wouldn't have known an hour and a half ago what you were talking about when you said autotelic. Thank you. Two more for you, T. Penultimate one. If it were stock, buy, sell, or hold blogging. Now, you seem to have done it a while, but the last one I see in your sites dated like January 2021. I mean, sell. It's dead. I'm sad about it, but I'm really worried that there's a lot of good qualities in blogging that are being lost right now. And I'm watching it from, as a former food writer, food blogs in some sense are getting replaced by Instagram. And one of my worries is that Instagram actually accentuates the, the visual aspect and not the food aspect. So, um, but yeah, there, it, my worry is that I'm sad because I think social media is giving us a more organized version of this. And a lot of that organization is tuning us to problems. Blogs were kind of the wild side, but that, I know it's dead. Well, and when you say dead, I mean, I didn't know if you were referring specifically to you're not planning on continuing blogging, or do you think capital B globally blogging is dying or dead? I think blogging has become a minor thing in the face of the more controlled environment of Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. And 
I'm kind of sad about it, but... Would you say that, uh, and certainly Neil Postman and some other cultural critics, um, at least one generation ago, were talking so much about the power of visuals and television taking away from print media and the enjoyment of novels and things. Is this the power of the image just starving out the power of the word? I'm not. I mean, I, I made an off-the-cuff remark, uh, remark about Instagram, but I actually, uh, I also think that Twitter is taking energy away from blogging in a lot of worrisome ways. And uh, I, my worry here is less about the visual than about the success of finely controlled platforms that have tuned their algorithm for quick engagement. Um, and that's yeah. more of the worry than the visual. All right, last one for you, T. Buy, sell, or hold, geeking out with me for a special short weekend extra just focused on tabletop games. Buy. Let's do it. All right. This has been a delightful 90 minutes or so with a new friend of mine, T. Nguyen. Thank you so much for generously sharing your insights and for taking the time to help us question more and ask, why are we doing what we're doing? Is it out of the best reasons? Will it lead to the best ends? While it's hard to ever give emphatic yeses to that, just asking the question so much of the time leads to better things. And you are an incredible asker of questions. You're also a wonderful answerer, I said to you before we started the podcast, you're one of those people, I can just kind of wind up with a simple question, let you go. You're so much fun to listen to and learn from. So T, thank you so much. And I look forward to doing this weekend extra on Tabletop Games. Full on, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a good time. As always, people on this program may have interest in the stocks they talk about. And The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. Learn more about Rule Breaker Investing at rbi.fool.com.